The following Oklahoma Zone original production is presented commercial free by Oklahoma Proton Center. The Oklahoma Proton Center has treated hundreds of children with cancer since opening in 2009. Many of these pediatric patients travel from out of town for treatment in Oklahoma City. Toby Keith saw a need for these kids and funded the construction of one of the premier pediatric housing facilities in the country, the OK Kids Corral. Thank you, Toby Keith, for your generosity helping our patients. The impact you made changed many lives, and your legacy leaves Oklahoma City a better place. Remembering Toby Keith. Good evening, I'm Robin Marsh. Tonight, Toby Keith, in his own words. When I interviewed country music icon Toby Keith late last year, I knew he was in a tough fight with stomach cancer, but I never thought my interview with him would be the final sit-down television interview he would ever give. Toby Keith welcomed us with open arms to his Norman home and tonight, we wanted to share with you more of my conversation with the country music star. Toby was so ready to talk all about his career, his music, his love for Oklahoma, and his faith during the storm of fighting cancer. Thank you, first of all, mm -hmm. so much, because I know you're busy, and I just want you to know that we're very grateful, first of all, for oh, uh, you talking with us. But uh, how are you doing today? You feeling okay? Yeah, I feel good. You do? Yeah. You're busy, Toby. Yeah. You don't stop, do you? Well, I did for two years. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's been a journey, hasn't it? It is. It's a, it's a lot of dark hallways. Yeah. Are you doing okay? I am. How do you maneuver through those dark hallways? Faith. Yeah, you have to have your faith. It's, uh, thank God that I got it too, but uh, it's in my DNA. I, think, I don't ever remember waking up one day and going, oh, that's how all this got here. It's like, as far back as I can remember, uh, I was born with faith, but um, it's always carried me through the, the darkest parts, but uh, he's always there, the Almighty's up being Almighty. He's been riding shotgun, mm -hmm. and a lot of people aren't as blessed as I am. This, uh, this ailment is, uh, is devastating and you can um, sometimes you get you go and find out you have it usually by the time you find out you have it you know by the time symptoms show up it's usually too late or a lot of times too late i know a lot of people so it's been two years in october since i was diagnosed so it's a little over two years and you just uh, you take it a day at a time it's a roller coaster and you really have to captain your own ship. You gotta get as much information as you can, and we could go on for hours about it, but it's, uh, it, you really have to captain your own ship, and you have to uh, lean on your faith. When you talk about leaning on your faith, has your faith deepened? Can you tell me how? Uh, I don't know if it's deepened. I understand it more. How so? Um, it's. I haven't had to lean on it my whole life as much. There's been obviously times that uh, that I've had to lean on it more than not, but it's like we take it for granted. We only use it in the dark times. You know the old, uh, you see plaques around that say, you know, how come I looked at the footsteps of my life and you were always walking with me until the darkest ones and then there's only one set of footprints and he says, well, that's when I was carrying you. It's that, you, you take it for granted on days that things are good and you lean on it when days are bad and it's taught me to lean on a little more every day. Have you experienced a peace that passes all understanding? Oh yeah, yeah. I finally got to a point in the spring, I was diagnosed in October of 21 and I was going through all the chemo and the first time I'd been through chemo and radiation surgery. And I just got to a point where I was comfortable with whatever happened. I had my brain wrapped around it and I was in a good spot either way. So uh, people without faith don't have that. You know, it'd be hard. It, it, when you think it's just gonna be flipping the light switch off, you know, but um, it, it's, uh, it's carried me a long way. What do you say to someone who might be watching this about your faith? Because sometimes it's hard for people to share their faith that you rely, I mean, you know, you're one of the most powerful people in country music, and I mean, I mean, just look around, 
and I mean, all the success and everything. And then, you know, I'm hearing you say that you've had to relinquish and surrender. How do you, well, how do you explain that to someone? Well, um, I've always prayed. I've always believed in a creator, you know. I was rolling down the road one time with a, one of my musicians from the old bar band days, and we were dragging that old van and trailer all over southwest part of the United States. And uh, me and him were the only two awake. I was driving. He was sitting up front, and he's, and uh, all I cared about is I was hungry. I wanted to be a songwriter. And I was really fighting, you know, to get to my position and where I was going to end up. Had no idea I'd end up here, but, but at the time, I dreamed it. And uh, we're going down the road, and he said, uh, he started talking, he was agnostic. And I said, so you don't believe in a creator at all? I go, well, you're not believing God? And he said, uh, well, I mean, he's never presented himself to me. I've never seen him. I said, really? And I'd remembered hearing him talk previous about he believed in UFOs. I go, but you believe in UFOs? He goes, yeah. I go, you ever seen one? <laughs> he goes, no. I go, touche, buddy. Yeah, look around. I, go, I can believe that there was a creator that created all this. Energy from the ground. We have electricity in the ground. We have an ozone. We have an earth that's full of energy that, uh, you know, lightning strikes the ground somewhere in the world every second of our life. And it energizes this, and the ozone, I guess, holds it in, and we have air. You don't have air in space, but something's holding that air in. Is this all just a natural occurrence, or is this, is this things talking to each other, keeping us? I mean, the thing spins for our gravity, holds us on this big blue and green marble. There's just too many things. And the power of prayer, when your prayers get answered, and you see the power of prayer, you, you know there's a creator, and it lives in your heart. It's not something that, um, it's not something that uh, somebody cults you into thinking, you know. Uh, Charlie Daniels said, God save us all from religion. Mm. So there is a lot of stuff going on in the world due to religion that creates a dark side, but there is one Almighty, you know, and if if you can live through Him, you can feel the feel the light. Mm -hmm. It's about a relationship, isn't it? It is. It's all relationship. You said uh, about having a prayer answered. Has there been a time that you've had a specific prayer answered that you could share? Oh, absolutely. The biggest one, uh, and I can't say it's the biggest life or death one, but when I was beating those bars up, I was literally making. 250, 230 bucks a week. We would get like 3,000 to play five nights somewhere. I'd drag that trailer to Las Cruces, New Mexico. You know, we'd have a flat and have to spend 10 bucks on an old tire and this. And then after five or six years of beating that road up, I was, a, I was getting in my late 20s. And every night I always prayed. And I didn't ask for anything, I always counted my blessings. And I said, if there's one thing, just guide me where I'm supposed to go. Because if this is what I'm supposed to be doing, please let me know. And even got to the point where I was like, if I get to 30 and I haven't done this, I'm going to switch occupations. You know, because I can't do this. I had two kids at the time. I've got three now, but at the time I had two children. It's like, I can't keep coming home and bringing 250 bucks and taking 30 and stick it in my pocket and eating off that all week rest of my life. But I was young enough that I could do it. Well, ironically, I'd gone to Nashville, been turned down. Yeah, you can sing. Yeah, you need to go back to the woodshed and work on your songs. So I had a little six-song cassette, and uh, it had six songs I'd written on it. And I got a deal through the manager of the club I worked when I worked Oklahoma City. Every eight weeks, I worked a club in Oklahoma City. And his nephew played for straight and uh, he'd written some songs, David Anthony. And uh, David Strait had played here, and David had come in the bar every time. And a couple times that Strait had played Oklahoma City, we'd been in, and the band would come out and hang out with Uncle Freddie. And he said, hey, I'll take him Jimmy Bowen and let Jimmy Bowen hear 
hear these songs and hear him sing. So they set up a meeting with Capitol Records. I went in. I didn't meet with Jimmy Bowen. I met with a flunky. <laughs> and the guy fast forwarded through my songs and said, we've got male singers. We don't need a band. And we do need a songwriter, but your songs. And I was like, cool. I wasn't even upset. I was like, hey, I got my shot. Came to Nashville, kid from Oklahoma, got my shot. I went home. So now I'm 29. And the summer, I turned 30 on July 8th. My parents' um, wedding anniversary is June 21st. Mm -hmm. And while I was in town, I'd run into some friends, and they said, hey, they used to see me out on the road, and now they're working in Nashville. And they came out to dinner with us, and they got a hold of a, uh, they wanted to have some music. So I gave them the cassette tape, and, uh, and one of them gave it to Harold Shedd, who discovered Alabama. K.T. Oslin, he was vice president of Mercury Records. And he heard it, and he goes, who is this guy? And they said, uh, that's Toby, he lives in Oklahoma. He wrote these songs, yeah. He goes, I'm gonna go see him. So on the morning of my mother, the 21st of June, so 20 days till my birthday You're or something? You're 29. I'm 29. And here for six years, this has been my goal, and I'm going to live to it. I've had my shot in Nashville. If I don't have my direction by 30, I may not just drop the ball today and quit because i got to keep some money coming in, but I'm going to look for another occupation. Phone rings. Will you hold for Harold Shedd? I'm like, God, yes. He goes, hey, I'm coming in Friday to hear you play. Can you play these songs? And I said, yeah. Flies in. The owner let me sing two 45-minute sets of original music I wrote. And, uh, Do you remember signed... those songs? Oh, yeah. What were they? Well, let me, tell you the fun, let me tell you the fun part of this story. I had two 45 minutes worth of songs I'd written, okay? He heard them. They were these six songs on this cassette, too. So um, he signed me the next morning. He said, I'm going to sign you a record deal, and I'm going to produce you. I'm literally days from my 30th birthday. On that cassette that Capitol turned down, should have been a cowboy. Ain't worth missing. Wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. Is that blue moon ever shine on you? All number three number ones, top five. It also had a song called Close But No Guitar. And it had a song that Harold loved, ironically, which is why he wanted to come hear me, called Valentine. And uh he absolutely loved Valentine. It was never a single, but that's the one that, that made him come see me. Was that the moment you thought, my life's changed, I've made it? Was that the moment that you thought, oh my gosh, this is, my Well, life I has knew changed? the door had finally been opened. Because in the music world, if you're a baseball player and you're playing at Podunk High School and you're hitting 50 home runs and you're batting 450, college will come find you. And if you're at a little college and you develop, the pros will come find you. In the music world, if you go to Nashville, there's a guy like me on, and everybody else on every corner of the town. Mm -hmm. So in the internet world, you have a better chance of getting heard. Best thing about music business was the internet, mm -hmm. social media, streaming. But it's the worst thing, too, because it's so muddy with the other stuff, too. So you've got good and bad getting right. flooded. Yeah. Um, we didn't have that. So somebody had to open a door for you. You had to, and if I lived in Nashville, I could network and, and meet and maybe get in a door. But living here, and I wasn't going to live, I never lived in Nashville. I always stayed in Oklahoma. I didn't move out there. So I thought, if I'm going to do it, I need to do it here because this is where my roots are. Well, uh, as, as it goes on, I knew I had the deal, but it ain't up to us. It's not up to us whether we're going to be successful. It's up to the listener. You know, what can I put out there that they're going to make them want to pull over and stop and buy this. Mm -hmm. And my first big glow of wow was they put me, my first tour out was me and Shania Twain and a guy named John Brannon. And they were arguing amongst the label heads of who they wanted to put out as their new artist. And Harold had promised me a year and a half. He said, he said, I'm going to have you out. I'm going to give you a year to work on your album. It's going to take six months from the day you signed me to get your contract signed. I'm going to work on your album a year. I'm going to put you out in January of 93. I said, okay. Well, the, by that time, the president had been fired. 
they brought another guy in from New York. Harold had signed Shania, and this guy liked Shania. He didn't like me. And he liked this other edgy cat named John Brennan. So they're arguing over who we're going to put out, and Harold's the vice president. He goes, I promised this kid a year and a half ago. So they agreed to combine both budgets, put us all three out, and say, we're going to call it the triple play and send you guys to major radio, major cities. You're going to have one band. You're each going to do 30 minutes. And everybody agreed to do that. So we went in. We put the three 30-minute shows together. We all got along. Had a, and at the end, the president comes in. And he goes, you're opening. You're opening. Shania's in the middle. My guy John's closing. So I was mad. I was like, so I went to Harold. I go, I want to knock him out. <laughs> and he goes, don't worry, pal. Just do your thing. It's going to take care of itself. We did. We left town. We left Nashville, headed to Louisville. And the bus had two lounges on it. So it was me, Shania, John, a road manager, his wife, six, eight bunks, and a lounge in the back front. And we're rolling. We get to Bowling Green, Kentucky. Shania's in the back. This is the radio. Me and John are up here getting to know each other. She comes screaming up the aisle. Oh, my God, you're on the radio. And we all ran to the back, and should have been a cowboy, just blaring on uh, Louisville or Bowling Green Radio. The first day that we rolled out, and I was like, first time I heard myself on the radio, I was like, yeah, y'all get you some of that. Your opener, your opener's getting some airplay. <laughs> so uh, we made it about six shows, and that song was so popular and blowing up the charts. And uh, finally, John came to me, and he goes, I want, you, I want to open. You need to close. And I said, and I was so mad at Luke, I said, no. I said, uh, I'm not going to do you like that, John. Mm -hmm. He goes, well, everybody stands in front of the stage until you, should I get off? And he goes, then no one's out there for me. He said, if I open, they'll at least be standing in front of the stage. And so uh, Luke called me, he said, uh, I need, he had to eat, eat crow, you know, he had egg on his face. He goes, I, I need you to switch to the front. I said, no, nah, deal's a deal. I'm not doing John like that. So a couple of days later, Harold flies into North Carolina. We're in Charlotte, and he goes, uh, I need you to do me a favor, pal. I said, yeah, well, anything, Harold. He goes, I need you to close this show. I said, oh, sure, for you, I'll do anything. <laughs> but that's how hard I was to work with, you know. I had so much pride, and I was like, you guys are going to treat me like this, and then I'm going to outrun you, and you're going to turn around. and." You've been running ever since, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, that's right. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay, so that was what you said, like January of 93 or so? Mm hmm Okay, so you did the Channel 9 song I in did. November of 93. Uh-huh. So you were on your way I had up. a couple of hits. Yeah, so can you t tell me about the Channel 9 thing? How did all that come about? Well, you know, we'd seen Reba do it forever, yes. you know? And uh, so it's like hearing the B.C. Clark jingle every Christmas. It was like when Channel 9 came on, you know? And my family was raised up watching Gary England. So we have so many storms here. It's like Gary England's the man. We still do it because, you know, it's like we've been taught when the, when the woolly booger gets here, it's time to go on the Friday <laughs> hole. You better get on Channel 9, you know, because the technology and the, how innovative he was. But So we would hear that uh, jingle, and all of a sudden out of the blue one day, they called me, and they said, hey, uh, we're going to, we want you to sing the jingle. And I was like, and silly as it is and fun as it was, it was like, I was just glad to get on TV. I was like, sure, I'll sing it. It's the spirit of Oklahoma And the best is yet to come TV night it was, uh, That was 30 years ago. It was 30 years ago. Uh, do you remember how much you got paid to sing that jingle? Probably nothing. I don't remember. <laughs> it didn't matter. I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> Oh my goodness, how far you've come. You have a big show coming up in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And with COVID, it was kind of, no one could work. And then you got sick. Mm -hmm. And that was a little bit of a derail for yeah. sure. And, you know, uh, you're still fighting through things, but you're like, I'm getting out there and performing. I love, I watched that Instagram thing and I was like, you go, Toby. Hey everybody, this is Toby Keith. I'm making a big announcement. I'm doing a little deal in, uh, Thought I'd start in the great Las Vegas. Be at the MGM at Dolby Live. I was gonna sit around here and uh, do nothing like I have been or get up and go outside and don't let the old man in, you know what I mean? 
Tell me about how all that came about. Well, I started, uh, when I started feeling better, it's like, uh, cancer's a roller coaster, so you're, it's like, you just sit here and wait on it to go away, it may not ever go away. Uh, and if it goes in remission, it's still gonna be in the back of your mind, you're still gonna have to do scans and stuff. But it was like, I'd jump up like in Cabo with Sammy Hagar, I'd get on stage with him. And I was like, I can sing, it didn't take that away from me. And then, uh, and then I've got the uh, Hollywood Corners out here, my roadhouse. Mm -hmm. So in the summer I said, tell the bands that are there this weekend that they're paid, but they're not working. And, uh, and they go, why? And I go, because I wanted to work out. I wanted to get up there, not take breaks every 45 minutes. We, we probably do two hour shows on the road. I wanted to do a three hour show each night, just see. And I said, I'll bring my band in and we'll just go out there. And I know it's going to leak out and it's going to get fun and big, but let it be a surprise. Let it, let it, let it blow up, right? And they said, well, who's, who's going to, what's the entertainment going to be besides uh, the bands that were scheduled to play? And I said, a group called the Greasy Weenies. <laughs> Oh my God. And so my manager goes, the Greasy Weenies. I said, yeah, I'm bringing them in, and I want them to have the stage for Friday, Saturday night. Well, that in and of itself alone was enough to intrigue everybody to go. <laughs> who the heck? Well, who the heck are the Greasy, the greasy Weenies? weenies. <laughs> so the night of the show. <laughs> this is hilarious. So the night of the show, it's only three miles down the road from my farm, ranch here. So I start down Franklin Road, and I get about a half a mile from... Hollywood Corners, and they're in the ditches down both sides. I get to the corner, I look, and far in each direction, as you can see, people are in the ditches. My whole six acres out back is full. My lot's full. It is slammed. We pull in. I pull back behind the stage. We walk up on stage, and we fire up, and we played three hours. We did it the next night. They were sitting on the roof. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was crazy. And... Uh, and we just said, hey, get on the bike. Let's see what we got. And I cruised through both shows. And so I went to my manager. Oh, okay. I said, how quick can we gear up and go? And he said, well, this, your trucks and buses and all that got a production. You got to build production for the stage. Mm -hmm. You got to have semis and buses. And, you know, you, you got to get a crew. Crews are all out with other acts. So mm -hmm. this ain't, we can't do this in August. And so my promoter of years and years, Brian O'Connell, said, I got a perfect spot. Let's put a couple of shows on sale in Vegas. If they sell out, there's one more date we can put on that the room's not taken. And they said, we're going to we'll put these on the show. Well, they sold out in like three minutes. Yeah, like two minutes. Two minutes, yeah. And then you did the third show. And so they put third on and bang, it went. And they go, what are you going to do? I go, put some more on. They go, the room ain't available. Oh. So I go, well, we can't work through Christmas. So mm -hmm. let's just pick a spot January, February, because I want to get through the New Year's with you know holidays i want to go to the ou bowl game and mm -hmm. get new year's and christmas all out of the way and i said fire up and go and uh here we are and you're feeling good yeah you can't let this define yeah, your good. future i've sat here probably hadn't done a handful of shows in the last three and a half years and i worked every single year of my life mm -hmm. i never took off mm -hmm. the way i amassed all that all that stuff up the top, songwriter stuff. Mm -hmm. A bunch of that in the middle. You know, song of the year, songwriter of the year, all that, is because I put an album out every year. My, con my peers and the colleagues I grew up with, you know, my buddies that broke out with me, our class, you know, Tim or Kenny, they might put one out ever, sometimes every two or three years. Mm -hmm. Or Shania, mm -hmm. they may put one out every five years. I was always, for some reason, stuck in a, at a label where their bottom line for the year counted on me to deliver. And being a songwriter, that's hard to do because you have to force out artistic creativeness. And, and so it was like... How do you do that? How do you write? I mean, it's like you get an idea. I was going to ask you about that song, Don't Let the Old Man mm -hmm. In, because that, like, can you share that story with sure. me? I mean, how do you, how does your mind work? You hear something and then you're like, I can make this a song. You know, I taught a class one day at OU, the music class. Really? And I didn't know. They buy me in. They said, we want you to do an hour. So I thought, what am I going to do? I thought, all right, I'm going to teach them the national number system, which is for people who don't read music, can transpose a song 
uh, they play music, but they don't read music. Mm -hmm. So I taught the class. The other 30 minutes I spent on songwriting. And I took the simplest structure of how to practice songwriting. See, I live in Oklahoma. If you live in Nashville, there's a million songwriters. Mm -hmm. You'll come friends with them. You'll go over their house. You'll sit around. You'll co-write. You'll network. You'll learn. You'll glean off this guy and that girl. You know? Mm -hmm. You'll learn. Where am I going to do that here? Mm -hmm. Where is that much talent here? There's not. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And anybody who is talented here usually moves there. To Nashville. So I had to learn on my own. And the way I taught myself was I view it as a wagon wheel. And the hub is your idea. So where I kept getting writer's block was sitting down here. And I'm, I'm going to write a song right now. So me and Robin are doing an interview is the first line. I love it. Me and Robin are doing an interview. Well, when I get down the road, what's going to be the rainbow pot at the end of the uh, gold at the end of the rainbow? What's going to be the money shot? What's going to be the payoff? You see what I mean? And I got to find that when I get there. If I start there, I can back up here and write to it. Mm -hmm. It's laying there waiting. So on. what's the pot of our interview? What what would our pot of the interview? Well, we, we'd have, we'd have to. That's why I hit writer's block after the first line because I don't know where this is going. But if you give me Don't Let the Old Man In, mm -hmm. that's the pot. And that song was a big moment for Toby last fall when he was honored as a music icon at the People's Choice Awards. Mm -hmm. Toby actually wrote this song several years ago. It was inspired when he was on a golf trip with his friend, Clint Eastwood, who was about to make a movie at the age of 88. And I go, what keeps you going? He goes, I get up every day, uh, don't lay around, I get outside, I go outside, and I don't let that old man in. I was like, wow, okay. So I thought, you know what? I love that old man. I'm gonna go home, write him a song, send it to him. Look out your window and smile Don't let the old man in Eastwood loved Toby's song so much he used it at the end of his movie, The Mule. Don't let the old man in What's your favorite line from that song? Um, uh, uh, my body's weathered and worn, ask yourself how old would you, would you be if you didn't know the day you were born? Try to love on you and stay close to your friend. I think that moment though of your wife, uh, she was yeah. she was wiping a tear away. Yeah. Um, what does she mean to you, Toby? Oh, she's been She's been a trooper. She's the best nurse. She absolutely, the first time we went to Houston to the hospital, she, she stepped right in and she just took control and said, we got this, let's go. So she's, she's like, we, we're going to get this and uh, don't worry about it. Every person in the room was just zoomed in and, and then you just deliver that message and it got its due and then it went number one the next day it was like trending like out of the so now they've released it to radio i was like toby's got a new song out no and it's four years old you just didn't hear it the first time because they didn't play it and your life was in a different time then yeah. and so the moment was perfect yeah but it found its home but don't let the old man You know, a lot of people don't know, know much about Trisha. I mean, she doesn't ever want the spotlight. No. Um, what would you say, uh, why do you love her so much? It's hard to stay with somebody this long. Yeah, how long have y'all been married? Um, be 40 years next year. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. But, um, I mean, when, you, when you're a young couple and one of you has to be gone all the time, it's like the military is the same way, you know. Um, that's why when I did those 240 USO shows in 11 years overseas, you know, I would see guys that, and girls that hadn't been home in 
they've been on their third deployment. They might have been home six weeks over the last three years. They're just gone all the time. Tough. It just takes, uh, you gotta find that first, you just have to find that perfect person. And it worked out for me, but it don't work out for most, I don't think. That's a really difficult uh, position to be in, but um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's nice to find somebody, she's a great mother, I have great kids, and uh, that's all due to her. I was just the provider, mm -hmm. you know? I just, uh, I just kept believing in myself and uh, I remember one time her father, he, uh, she said, you know, when I was working like three nights in Tulsa, I'd be five nights in Amarillo, six nights in Las Cruces. The next week I would have three nights in Tulsa. And next weekend I had three nights and I'd have four days. Off. She said, go make some money with dad. So I'd go work with her dad. He had a yeah. plumbing truck and he, he goes, uh, you know what? You're a pretty hard worker, kid. He said, uh, if you ever quit this music thing, he goes, uh, come over and be a, work for me, I'll put a second truck out. <laughs> and I uh, came home and, she, and he'd called my wife, said, I'd like to, if he ever quits this music thing, it's a real job. He said, I'd like for for him to uh, become, you know, apprentice and then put a second truck out and build my company. And I said, uh-uh. <laughs> I'm not cut out to be a plumber. I'll work, make my money now, this part of my plan, but I said, I gotta, I gotta live my dream. First. You had to make that music thing work, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I'd have been a hell of a plumber. <laughs> you ever write a song about that? No. <laughs> I have a song idea. Yeah. Okay, it's called uh, the F word, forgiveness. Oh, love it. And that it it leads to a four letter word, three. And so I don't know, like my mind always is twirling goofy things, but I'm always like, there's got to be something about like forgiveness is a good one. It is a good one. Yeah. You can, uh, you can, um, get ideas from different places, but the wagon wheel thing that I taught songwriters that I teach songwriters, there's a million ways to write a song. And I've written a few from letter A to Z, um, and got lucky, but it's more frustrating. And that's where you quit practicing is when you've, uh, you get frustrated. And if you'll start with your pot of gold and build to it and practice that way every day, if you, if you don't have a better idea that day, just take the idea you have and run to it where it's waiting on you, you'll end up practicing more. And, you know, I wrote, I don't know, when I was 14, 15, I wrote a handful of songs. And then 17, 18, I wrote three handfuls of songs. Mm -hmm. And as I went on, all of a sudden I wrote a decent one. And somebody goes, that's a good song. And they say, hey, I want to hear that. So we'd be in a beer joint over here. You know where my water tower is? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right underneath that water tower. It used to, it's white and got my painting on it now. I think it's finally quit working. I think I'm going to tear it down and move, <laughs> move, my, move my name somewhere else. But um, it was rusty and old. Right underneath it was a dump dive bar called the feed store. And we'd play in there right out of the garage band days. And one of the guys smoked cigarettes. We'd go out on break and we were standing right there looking at water tower. Never in my wildest dreams could I imagine they're going to sandblast that thing and paint it someday and put my name on it. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And I'm sitting there in that little dump bar and it's literally on the other side of the gravel parking lot right there. But, uh, I, I finally wrote a song. They want me to play in that bar. And, uh, and then I wrote a bunch of other crappy songs. And then I wrote another good one. And as time went on, that distance started to do this. Mm -hmm. The distance between good and bad started getting closer. And then I got hungry. And then people started saying, uh, you're a good writer, mm -hmm. you know? And so I was like, I can be a songwriter. I never even knew I would be an artist, but I thought I'm gonna be a songwriter. I just happened to have a flamboyant, outgoing, uh, loud personality that could deliver these songs. And then that became another part of my life where my first three or four albums, I, were, I was doing what they told me to do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was working and I was having some number ones and hits, but I was still kind of a B artist. And one day I just went in and they kind of critiqued my album a little bit and it pissed me off. I was like, I was like, you know what? I'm going to start dressing out of my closet. I'm going to start singing my songs. 
and I'm going to captain my ship, and I have a l no problem in sinking this ship and me driving it, but I got a hell of a problem with you being the captain and it sinking, right? And then my career went into the stratosphere. You've applied that to many areas then of your life, even with your cancer journey that yeah. you shared. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, having faith, captain your own ship, believe in yourself, because you can sleep at night if you do it your way and you fail. But if you fail doing it somebody else's way, I can't sleep at night. Yeah. And you missed it. I did. Yeah. It's like I'm not your poster child, Nashville. I don't live there. You know? Why'd you always stay in Oklahoma? I mean, so many people, they might have a house here, but then they really have moved to Nashville. But you never did do that. I, I, I was raised right here in this six area, six mile area. My mom lives, the farm I was raised on where my mom and dad, and my mom's still alive. It's three miles north of Hollywood Corners. I'm three miles east of Hollywood Corners. And I grew up fishing the river that runs through my ranch here. I fished crop. I'd come out here and park at that bridge when this was just woods. Mm -hmm. And I'd fish that creek. This is where I was raised. This is where I come home to. Mm -hmm. So I can go to the house of Colorado. I can go to Cabo in the winter. I can go to my lake house at Grand Lake. You know, I can go anywhere in the world I want to go. But after six or seven days, I'm like, I gotta get back to my ranch. You know, I, mean? I need to get back to my to my home, and uh, it's all fun to go when you go. But uh, it's I, I just never felt good, and as I I never felt good about living, moving to another city and living there. It was like this is where I was raised, mm -hmm. so I didn't care, and it cost me um, not necessarily all the award shows and stuff, if it matters. But uh, I mean. There's 13 CMA awards, and if you're a male, you can get up for nine of them. And I have been up for nine of them. I've been number one ticket seller. I've been in a four week in a four year period uh, between '02 and '03 to '06, '07, right in there. There's 208 weeks of Billboard charts, and I was 52 weeks sitting at number one in that four year period. Mm -hmm. Songs I wrote. Not number two, sitting at number one, you know, multiple number one. And I'm up for everything, and I would go over at the awards because there's only a certain amount of signed up voters in Nashville that vote on these awards, and they've all got their agenda mm -hmm. people they vote for. Well, me not living there, I don't, I've just got my manager and my booking agent, my lawyer and my team, but I don't have the network that everybody else has. And here I'm, I mean, Alan Jackson goes up there and receives male vocals of the year, and I'm sitting on the front row. He goes, I almost didn't come tonight. And I won this award. He goes, Toby's sitting on the front row. I, I, he knew, you know, he's like, mm -hmm. but I didn't care. I was like, I'll sacrifice that to get to live here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. I don't care about that trophy. Yeah. I care about those songwriter awards. Yeah. But that voted on by the industry stuff. Mm hmm. They knew who Big Dog Daddy was that year. <laughs> I love they it. They knew what kind of year I had. I wanted to talk with you a little bit about um, the um, Corral Center that you mm -hmm. do. Um, just how that means so much to families. And, you know, it's a tough time. And especially when it's children mm -hmm. involved and, and going through a similar path of the journey that you've been on, you know. Um, just what does that mean to your heart, and uh, how do you keep that, uh, you know, sustained every year after year? You know what's amazing is the first thing I thought of when I got cancer was who's going to take care of the corral? Who's going to fund the corral? Who's going to raise the money? Who will carry that torch? It was one of the first thoughts I had. So my guitar player, Scott Webb, had a two-year-old daughter, Allison. And she had Wilms, I believe it was called Wilms cancer. And it's supposed to be pretty curable, but they didn't get it for some reason. And all of my um, donations at that point, my charity stuff, had gone to St. Jude's. So when they sent her into hospice, I said, let me call St. Jude's. So I, I called in a favor. I'd been giving them money for years. I knew the connections. I said, I have a little girl. She's been put in hospice. I said, anything they said send us her her chart they called back and said uh there's a couple of things that that they don't have there that we got here 
that we can try. I told her mother, her mother didn't wait five minutes. She threw Allison in a car seat and drove to Memphis on a, just on a sec, hat, drop of a hat. Oh, well, yeah. She was gone. Go. Well, they didn't, they didn't have any luck. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at the funeral, we went to a church to eat afterward. And uh, she said, thank you for what you did. She goes, um, but the m most amazing part of St. Jude's that we didn't have here is I show up with nothing. She said, I don't have a, I don't have a toiletry bag. I don't have any clothes. I don't have much money. I didn't grab anything. I just grabbed Allison and thought every second counts. And I hooked it to Memphis. Well, if I'd have knew she was going to leave right then, I'd have stuck her on my plane and sent her. But as soon as I called her, she she was gone before I even could call her husband. Mm -hmm. She took off. And she said, the amazing thing, they had, I got there and they put me in this house and I didn't want for anything. She said, I had Walmart cards, uh, gift cards, soup and sandwiches, cereal, 24-7, three hot meals served, shuttle service to and from our appointments. They would come get us and take us to our appointments. She said, this is the most amazing. I said, there's our calling. Mm -hmm. We need to do one here. And she said, oh, that'd be great. And so it took me, I started out here at Belmar Country Club. I had my first fundraiser 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It took me 10 years to get the money built up. It took me seven or eight years to acquire the property across the street from the Oklahoma Children's Hospital. Luckily, we were right across the street. Mm -hmm. It took me uh, uh, 10 years to get to that point. Then we built a beautiful facility. I got all of the oncologists and the doctors to get together, put the, I formed a great, I, I put together a great board of doctors and attorneys and bankers and, and, uh, and got this whole network and, and this machine running. 16 rooms with four I think it's neutropedic. It's where you live behind the plastic mm -hmm. in the bubble. You have immune. Mm -hmm. I think it's neutropedic. So where, but uh, so you so you're gonna need three or four of those rooms. So we've got one wing where you literally push the doors with the plastic back, and you have to really put on the stuff to go yeah. in there, you know. And then the other rooms. And then I said I want it fun, so we brought some ex Disney uh, cartoonist stuff in. And we put the theme around Route 66 and painted all these great pictures on the wall. It has a chapel, it has a big dining room. It's Ritz Carlton meets Disney World. Mm. <laughs> and it's free. Yeah. But it costs money. I got I gotta raise that every year. And each year we raise more money. We raised almost two million dollars in one night last year. Wow. Right here in Oklahoma. I got ninety thousand people living in Norman when school's in. And I go to Riverwind Casino. And I get on that stage, I bring an act in, sing a couple of songs with them, turn them loose, I do my auction. People donate wonderful stuff. And the beauty of it is Juliet Bright is the mother of the play. She's, I couldn't even keep it open without her. She's so good. But she, uh, she has people come in and cook for the kids. And so it's turned into like an office building in Dallas will pick a, day out of their year and they'll do an office retreat and they'll stop, get groceries, food, come in, they'll be on a list and they'll come in on their day and the men will change out light bulbs and work on stuff, you know, wrenches and stuff. The women and cooks, whoever the cooks are, will cook three hots for them and then clean everything up then and they drive back to Dallas. And I've got, I stayed about 160 days out on the waiting list perform wow, those. To come. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. And it's it's my best gift I've ever given to the world. Wow. That's amazing, Toby. Do you think you know the struggle it's been to go through cancer? I mean, when you see these kids, I mean, they're tough as nails, aren't they? I can't stand it. It just, I go up there and visit it and it's, it, I just can't stand it. It's, the beauty in it is that some of them are so young they just don't know. Yeah. So there's a blessing there. Mm -hmm. But the therapy that we bring is that everybody staying there has an affliction. Mm -hmm. 
So if you go to school and chemo's taking all your hair and you're in first grade, kids are going to be mean. They don't know any better. And that kid's got to put up with that. But in here, we all look the same. Mm -hmm. So there's family therapy. It's there, you know, there's therapy in that. Uh, the kids have a good environment to, to live in. It's a great facility, mm -hmm. and it's uh, in a lot of ways. You've blessed so many people. Yeah. We do 300 families a year. Wow. It's unbelievable. How are you in your cancer journey? Do you mind my asking, like, yeah. where are you today and everything? Yeah. So it's, it's always a roller coaster. Um, I've had it to zero, and five weeks later, oh, you're, you're storming back. Uh, but if you're going to live on, with treatments and things, whatever, whatever you find that works for you, that holds it at bay, mm -hmm. and all that, you just do. And as long as I don't shrivel up to a prune and, and hit the dirt, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, and I have energy, yeah. I'm going to try to go. And um, you don't ever cure it. Everybody has it, and you don't ever cure it. You just, it just goes into remission. Mm -hmm. So you got to find, again, captain your ship, mm -hmm. find your own deal. But I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to let this define what my future is. Anything else you want to add, Toby, uh, that might be important uh, just for people who are, are going to watch this? Well, I would say, uh, again, I can't, um, for people that are watching, Cancer's an island that sits out in the middle of the lake with other islands. And we know that's Cancer Island. Mm -hmm. So you take your boat, you don't even really want to look over there. You just want to act like it don't exist. Mm -hmm. And when you wake up one day and you're shipwrecked on that, there's a lot of boats on that island. Mm -hmm. And you find out how many people really have cancer. And you just need to, uh, I would tell anybody to, especially if you're given a second chance to fight it, some people don't even get that opportunity. You just walk in, they go, oh, good news, bad news, you know. Good news is you won the lottery. Bad news is you're not going to be able to spend it, you know, it's that kind of thing. And um, doctors are like mechanics, you know. Go in, i got a leaky muffler. My muffler's making a sound. Yeah, your transmission's out too. Mm -hmm. So if they scan on you long enough and they look at you long enough, they're going to find stuff. And... You're going to get second opinions and third opinions, and they're not all going to sound the same. And it makes it really difficult to the average person, especially somebody who don't have my resources. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't even know. I mean, I've got the best resources in the world. Most people don't have those connections and resources. But uh, all I can tell them is you really have to get in control of your ship. You have to be as well-read as you can be. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, do what's best for you. And it, it ain't always chemo. It ain't always radiation. It ain't always surgery. And that's the protocol. But uh, that's what they tell you to do. And that don't mean that these doctors and these physicians and these scientists are trying to kill people. That, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is everybody's taught in medical school, residency, and uh, they're placed in residency. And then they, they're practice. They've, they've They've got their own book of how they were taught, mm -hmm. just like any other class in school. And there's good ones and bad ones. And they're all working. And it's a tough road to weed through. Mm -hmm. But lean, if you have faith, lean on your faith. Make the best decisions you can for you. And uh, never give up. Keep just keep on cranking at it. You've had some really good friends. Uh, Bob Stoops is, you know, it seems like Bob and Barry and Becky and have kind of been on this journey with you. What does that close-knit of friends mean to you? Oh, the love that poured out from the whole world uh, when I announced it was overwhelming. At first, I was like, I didn't know anybody really cared that much, you know. I see somebody post something, I don't just drop to my knees and start praying for every single story I hear. But boy, it sure felt like that when I did it, you know. They directed it right at me, so... Uh, I've always dealt with it. Uh, I always take for granted how big uh, my uh, fan base is. Mm -hmm. I've always called them warriors, and I kind of take them for granted, but they always show up. So when I first got in the business 30 years ago, 
you know, I took on haters like a wounded grizzly bear. I'd go get you. You know what I mean? I'd say, come on, bring it. Let's go. I got a platform. You know, what have you ever done to change the world? Mm -hmm. And as you get older, you're like, uh-uh. You remember when Bosworth sold the shirts at the Denver mm -hmm. game? And he, all the Denver people were wearing the stamp out Boz shirts and then mm -hmm. found out he was selling them outside. <laughs> it's stuff like that that makes you go, you need haters. They make you a lot of money. And they embolden and empower your, your fan base. You know, the people who love you are empowered by haters. And when you embrace that, it's like watching wrestling on TV. <laughs> you got a heel and you got a good guy. And the only way to make the ratings go up is to make the good guy jump over here with the heels and create something like, you got to be kidding me, Hulk Hogan's over here with these guys. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. It's like that's the way they make their money. Yeah. It's like, it's a, uh, and, and when you learn that and you've been around long enough, then you just smile at haters. You're like going, oh, I'm getting so paid right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey, uh, hang on a second. So uh, we thought about this. Okay. And we got a gift for you. And we think you're going to like it. We put a lot of thought to it. So um, you just can take the lid off of it. It'll be easy to unwrap. Christmas came early. I know. We surprised Toby. It's nothing. It's a brand new day. Does it say the pay in here? Yeah. Oh, six thousand dollars. With that old contract he signed back in 1993. Check when he ago. sang the spirit of Oklahoma song. Me and Channel Nine have been banging it forever. This is great. This ought to be framed, and I'm gonna frame this up. Is that crazy? Oh, that's really nice of you, Robin. That, tell everybody thank you. Uh, that's a big deal for a local boy, too. You bet. You know? And uh, 20 years later, I'm sitting on 60 Minutes across from Dan Rather getting grilled about courtesy red, white, blue. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm ready for you. I did the Channel 9 jingle, buddy. <laughs> Bring it on. Uh, I love it. I love it. Toby, we just are so grateful. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you're an inspiration. And... I mean, it's so impressive everything that you've done, but just the man that you are and the man that you've become through a trial. I mean, you know, I've always heard that your test becomes your testimony. Mm -hmm. And this is part of your testimony, yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, well, everybody, has, he has a plan for everybody. And uh, if this is my plan, so be it. And if it didn't, but whatever, you know, if uh, I could be a great spokesperson for him, I think. But um, you go through whatever you're supposed to go to, through, and through that relationship, you have to find the silver lining and count the blessings that are there, you know? I know so many people who didn't get the opportunity to even fight it. And I'm sitting here today feeling good and knowing what I'm dealing with, and I got my brain wrapped around it, and, and my faith lets my light shine, you know? The light at the end of the tunnel is, uh, the Almighty, it's not a train coming, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, uh, you either get on the train or get in front of it, but get out of my way. Did you have a, have you, do you have a scripture that you've clung to? Um, is there one scripture that you've, you know, I always think of that, you know, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind, and I'm like, sometimes I just got to call on a sound mind. Uh, John 3.16 is so simple, it, you know, you don't go to church, you cuss, you do this, you drink wine, you, you know, mm -hmm. I, it's like, it doesn't say, doesn't say if you do all of these things and you pay this much money and you go to this church this many times, and, mm -hmm. you know, that you go to heaven. It says, believe it. Whosoever believe it would not perish, but mm -hmm. have everlasting. That's all it says. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. It doesn't say whoever believeth and does this laundry list over here. Mm -hmm. It says believe. That's the word that you gotta get through to everybody. Mm -hmm. And what's so hard about believing, what's hard is not believing. What's the result in that? What if I'm wrong and I believe for, and it really doesn't exist? Well, I still ride the other train, right? And then once you believe and you start having a relationship and you start getting fulfilled, all of a sudden it, it turns around and you start to go, oh, I see. So. Newest treatment I'm on, I go to Florida to get a new treatment. 
I come home the next morning and you get numbness in your feet from chemo. So I'd been off chemo two or three weeks. My feet had been numb for months. And I was really worried about my feet. And I go get this new treatment. And I get up the next morning not thinking nothing about it. I fly back in here, get in bed. And my feet hit that cold floor. And I could feel my feet. And I could feel my sensors firing. And I could feel the balls of my feet balancing me. And I went, wow. And I have a book that has my daily scripture in it. Mm -hmm. So I look down. This is the day. It's dated. This is what I'm supposed to read this, my morning scripture. And it says, now that you've chosen the path, the road less taken, trust in me in your direction, and my light will shine on you. That was my scripture for that day. Wow. Now, if I'd have went Tuesday and Wednesday, that scripture would have been That's that day. I wouldn't have said that. Yeah. But the day I was chosen, and I looked at the other scriptures around it in the other days, none of them applied to this that day. One. But this day it said, and I was on a, I went to Florida to get a new treatment, come home, overnight I can feel my feet, and it made me go, wow, this is the best my feet have felt in over a year. Wow. Something happened in that treatment that Amen. cleaned me. And I go, I wonder what my scripture's gonna say. And when I open my little book, I'm thinking, I wonder what this is gonna say in here. And that's what it said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, God orders your steps, doesn't he? Yeah. 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 Thank so, you so much for sharing yeah. all this. We're really grateful. Well, thanks for doing it. Yeah, you bet. As I reflect back on our conversation with Toby Keith, the takeaway for all of us, how to live. Toby was the best example of making memories, living life to the fullest, and loving the people he was around. The Toby Keith family has asked, if you would like to make a donation, please do so to the Toby Keith Foundation. It supports the OK Kids Corral, which is a haven for families who have children fighting cancer. My make-a-wish gift to this kid is what he wanted done. He wants to sing this song with me. I'm just trying to be a father. He's a daughter and this son. When I think about Toby, there's a gold lantern that's in the lobby of OK Kids Corral, and it's the biggest and brightest one there, and it has his name on it. And that's what Toby is to the foundation. He's that bright light. A loving husband, a doting father and grandfather, Always there for his family. Got the news on Friday morning, but a tear I couldn't find. If he spoke to you, it had something to do with it, and whatever he said, he, he book it. He, it's not made up, it's sincere, and it's the way he thought and felt. Everybody can really see a part of themselves in him and his music. A great artist. And I always respected how he did things his way and didn't care what anybody thought. Toby taught me not to prejudge a guest and to have my intention, but to keep my eyes open to the reality of who they are. And for that lesson, and for a lot of other things, I'm always going to be grateful. Yeah, he's been a great friend, he's a great OU supporter to all the sports, not just football, and it's always fun through the years to see him on the sideline, give him a bump right before the game. He left a mark on our heart that will last forever. Just a, a beautiful guy, beautiful family, and uh, he'll be missed. No, there won't be another Toby Keith. There'll be some country music singers, but there won't be a Toby Keith. But don't let the old man leave.